Welcome to the Cybersecurity Simplified Podcast, where we take the mystery out of today's top security threats and solutions. The adoption of connected devices in medical practices and hospitals is rising quickly, improving operational efficiencies, but also exposing networks to viruses and other threats. Our guest today is Debbie Gash, Senior Vice President and Chief Digital Officer for St. Luke's Health System in Kansas City, Missouri. Debbie has a long history in healthcare IT management and consulting, and she's very familiar with the digital transformation taking place in medical practices, along with the risk of cyber infections that come with it. Stay tuned as we talk to Debbie about the security challenges of the Internet of Medical Things, also known as IOMT. We'll explore how to keep your network healthy. Hint, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Hey, everyone. I'm Susanna Song. And I'm co-host Dave Barton. Well, this is an exciting episode, uh, David, because I know I always say that's an exciting uh, episode, but I really do think our topics are are getting better. And joining us today, if you're watching on YouTube, is Debbie. So welcome, Debbie. Thank you. Glad to be here. What uh, currently what are you doing at St. Luke's? Well, my role is uh, chief digital officer for the organization, and we are really focusing on becoming a digital health system and seeing how we can leverage technology to innovate and how we deliver care, uh, be more efficient, uh, leverage automation, uh, and uh, solve some of the challenges that, uh, you know, are uh, we're currently dealing with in our industry. Um, so uh, we're really uh, moving very fast and towards uh, digital adoption and uh, trying to find those technologies that are going to help us accomplish our business objectives. Um, so, you know, we've been, uh, you know, deploying technology uh, in the clinical space in our hospitals. Uh, we have a hospital in your home program with that is at its foundation leveraging technology to allow us to care for patients in new care settings and are going to continue to do that. And of course, uh, considerations around information security certainly are uh, top of mind when we're focusing on those initiatives. And David, let's break down OT, IOT, and IOMT. For, for those who are not familiar, um, how, how do those all relate? And tell me the relationship and what all of that means for uh, cybersecurity. So at the end of the day, they're all very similar uh, in that you have embedded devices that are difficult to protect, difficult to monitor, um, difficult to protect and and respond to. In most cases, these OT, which you typically see uh, in manufacturing, IOT, you're seeing in banking, and 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 now we've got this new designator called IOMT. And, and frankly, and until I really started looking at this problem in healthcare, I didn't know they had their own uh, acronym. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and Debbie probably has some insight on that. But at the end of the day, as a security practitioner, my job is to protect assets in my environment. And healthcare in particular struggles with these devices that are, that are mission critical, that, are, that save patient lives. They run embedded operating systems, but they can't patch them. And, and I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you what the problem is. I'd rather have Debbie kind of give us a, a little bit of background on on some of the challenges they face with these biomedical devices. But at the end of the day, any device that I can't put an agent on, that I can't uh, patch, is difficult as a practitioner for me to secure. And, and that's the problem that we're facing globally. It's not, it's not just the healthcare problem, by the way. It's any any industry that relies on embedded systems, uh, manufacturing, healthcare, banking. Um, you know, we, we see it in airports. A lot of those passenger 
uh, management systems and airline management systems are all embedded and they struggle with protecting them as well. So it, it's, it's certainly an interesting topic. We're seeing a lot of legislation and, and Debbie, I want to pick your brain on that too, uh, that is driving adoption of security to protect these devices. Yeah, well, Jeff, if for, you want to jump in. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the the thing that is uh, interesting in healthcare is we leverage a lot of devices to help care for patients, diagnose patients, treat patients. Um, and these devices have a technology component to them. They have a software solution. They run on a Windows operating system. And uh, you have a, an embedded firmware in the device. You have a, uh, it may connect with a server somewhere sitting in uh, your data center. And then that server is then communicating with uh, your electronic health records. And, uh, and those devices themselves are regulated. Um, the manufacturers have to get approval from the FDA um, to get them certified. And uh, if you change that platform, that software, it has to go through the recertification process. And the understanding is that it's not just the application software that changes, if anything, about the firmware the, or the operating system or anything about that device is changed. It has to go through recertification. So the manufacturers do not give uh, anyone the ability to patch the operating system because, it, in their opinion, it has to be recertified. So they control it. They lock it down. It's like a black box for us. And so we're highly dependent on the original equipment manufacturer to keep the device updated, keep those uh, operating systems secure and patched. Um, and uh, the timing of that is generally uh, significantly behind where you want to be uh, in uh, managing some of these threats that exist out there and these weaknesses in a Windows platform. Um, so we have to, as a healthcare organization, look at alternative ways to protect those devices until they can be patched or until the manufacturer comes up with the next uh, version or upgrade. And so it puts the device at risk while we're waiting, unless we come up with some alternative method of protecting that device. Um, so I think the challenge on healthcare is, is trying to navigate with the manufacturers, their speed to processing these changes, um, and then, uh, you know, I, it, unfortunately, it just doesn't happen quick enough because of this requirement to take these devices through review. Uh, and that takes time. So, Debbie, for our, our listeners and viewers, when you talk about IoT and healthcare, what, what kind of devices are we talking about? Because I'm not a healthcare practitioner. I don't. I don't know what's IoT and what's normal devices, but what are the types of systems that that would fall under this type of uh, requirement? So it could be a patient monitor, um, so a bedside monitor that is tracking your uh, patient's vital signs. Could be a uh, IV pump, uh, which distributes the medication to a patient through an IV tube. Um, usually there's a pump that controls um, the delivery of the medication. Uh, it could be an imaging device. So an MRI machine or a CT scanner or a plant, you know, that's all digital imaging. Uh, and those devices run uh, typically with a Windows uh, operating system at the heart of them. So it can be uh, any of that kind of device. It could be a wearable device um, that a patient has. Um, anything that a, that is a piece of equipment that attaches to the network and talks to the systems. Um, and included in that are facility monitoring devices. So refrigerator, temperature readings, those are Internet of Things as well. 
Um, so there's a plethora of equipment within the facilities. And now that the care is moving to the home, we have the whole internet of things that can happen outside of the walls of the hospital that is contributing obviously to the challenges that we have. Got it. It's safe to say that unlike banking and manufacturing, your IOT devices impact the lives of patients. Correct. Uh, we use them to, you know, identify deterioration. We use them to diagnose patients. Uh, so, uh, all of those uh, devices uh, that are considered medical equipment uh, that have that technology associated with them are life-saving, uh, you know, life care devices. Absolutely. Okay. And and for our listeners, the other thing I wanted to, to make sure you guys were aware of is if if you're at a manufacturing plant and a machine goes down. They don't divert patients for life-saving health care. In a hospital environment, if an IoT device that's maybe needed for emergency services goes down, you guys have to divert patients maybe en route somewhere else. Fair, fair statement? Well, um, actually, uh, medical devices are built highly redundant. Um, so if they lose their network connectivity, they can operate in a standalone mode. Um, Got it. So in, in that regard, um, that is a safety feature and that is a requirement of these devices. The challenge is that if you lose the capability to communicate with that device or receive information from the device, now you have to adjust your resources um, and so instead of having a, a device at a central station showing you a display of what's happening in multiple beds, you have to then put someone at each bed to monitor the uh, that device. Um, so yeah. the, it challenges us in how we operate and the efficiencies associated with the technology. Uh, but uh, I don't want to give people the impression that if the network goes down, this equipment doesn't work. Because that is not the case. No, um, no, that, <laughs> that wasn't what I was trying to get to either. I, yeah. I, I just know that at one point we had a conversation around divert, diversion or uh, with regard to patients and systems having some requirement to, to have full connectivity. It, and, it makes and I just it wanted very them to challenging. Know. It makes it very challenging to deliver care. And yes, if you're not very efficient, then you might have to uh, divert patients to alternate facilities because you can't move quick enough. Got yeah. it. Well, in, in Debbie, the world of cyber, I was just say one more one more point, Susanna. In the world of cyber, if that device gets hacked or attacked and is no longer functioning, or a whole group of IV pumps or whatever, if, if they are not functioning because they've all gotten a virus or there's some hack on them, there's a potential where you got that hospital might not be able to take a patient. Is that is that a fair statement? Um, well, I I think that uh, it would make it more challenging for uh, them to uh, do. I guess the non-emergent, non-critical, life-saving work. Got it. Um, okay. So I, I think that the the challenge it presents is the ability to operate uh, normal and um, you know take care of patients who are non-critical as well as those who Got are it. critically ill. Okay. All right. Sorry, Shannon. Yeah, go ahead. Are no, those are all really great questions, David. I, I have a question, Debbie. It seems like time is of an essence when you're when you're depending on the manufacturer to patch. So we know that the hackers and the bad actors are um, you know, are looking for opportunities with this very, very like now it seems like an infinite threat landscape. So what what do healthcare systems manufacturers like what can you do when you're depending on a manufacturer who, who may not be up to speed and may not be working fast enough to provide 
uh, you know, the latest patch. What can well, we do? I think you have to look for other uh, options uh, to protect uh, both the device and your environment. And uh, that's where, you know, we've kind of leveraged some of David's advice uh, in looking at some of those alternate um, solutions out there. Um, you know, we we focus on, uh, you know, contractually trying to obligate manufacturers to perform and do the things that we need them to do to take ownership and accountability. But like I said, there's a limit to what they can do because of the regulatory mm -hmm. um, process they go through. So we've been looking for what are the ways that we can protect ourselves, protect the devices, uh, and kind of mitigate those those industry challenges and leverage other alternatives to securing the network and securing the devices. And uh, I think micro segmentation is sure. the key um, for us, particularly with the Internet of Things. That is something that we're we're deploying and uh, have been able to um, you know, start putting some of these critical devices uh, under a micro segmentation network and uh, hope that that is uh, another layer of protection uh, that we can afford in our organization. So could one of you explain to our audience and viewers what exactly is micro segmentation in the context of cybersecurity? I'm going to let David take that one. <laughs> I, I thought you might. Uh, I was I was waiting. Um, so, in the cybersecurity industry, for probably the last fifteen years, we've been talking about this idea of zero trust. And zero trust, at its base form, is only allowing known known ports, protocols, destination sources that are required to do the job, and denying everything else. And up until the last probably five years, it's been difficult to implement that, which is why it's been so difficult to protect IoT devices. What we're seeing today is a couple of technologies that are moving to the front of the pack that let us micro-segment, which effectively is taking a whole lot of, of bandwidth and segmenting it down, in this case, network capability, segmenting it down to a device and in doing so, also segmenting it down to only allowing known good or known necessary ports, protocols, sources, destinations, all of those things. And so what we end up with is the ability to take a device, an IV pump, and isolate it from the administrative network, right? So the people who were uh, doing billing won't it, and they get infected won't impact an IoT device or vice versa. If the IoT device, the manufacturer plugs in a USB device, it gets infected with micro segmentation. It can't go infect other devices. And, and this is how we're going to get to solving that IoT problem. I think globally is finding a way to efficiently, effectively, easily take devices, put them in separate networks, still still providing visibility, management, um, response capabilities without an agent and and, a, and affecting that micro segmentation approach. So I, was, cool. Would that make sense, Susanna? Yeah, so without an agent, Debbie, like what's what's the the benefits of not having an agent, an agentless micro segmentation offering or solution for, for the hospitals? Well, I think it's uh, less complex to implement, quite frankly. Um, uh, trying to uh, provide one for every single device and, and set that up, I think, is much more complicated and more difficult to do. Um, and I, I worry about the cost associated with it. Um, so I, I think a software type of an approach uh, versus an appliance type of an approach makes uh, it makes it a lot easier to deploy and uh, to manage and to, um, you know, leverage across uh, the scope of our enterprise. Um, 
So and we have a variety of different devices and, um, you know, putting putting an appliance on every single device. And I've looked at that mm -hmm. um, is actually quite costly. What I think, yeah. too, the, the the aging piece that you talked about, Susanna, in the healthcare world re will require recertification every time you change the agent or even if the manufacturer will let me put one on the device. And so there's there are embedded OSs that I just can't. I can't put an agent on. Yeah, very, very true. Uh, Debbie, you know, David talks a lot about this in, in our podcast around defense in depth, right? There isn't just one solution that's going to, you know, keep the bad guys out or the threats uh, locked out of, of networks. Do you, do you also buy, buy that kind of approach? I mean, you're obviously, you need to still patch. Um, you, now you've introduced micro segmentation uh, to your health system and uh, to protect you know, your IOMT, um, what other security solutions out there make sense for the healthcare industry? Well, I think that the, you have to have layers of protection, lots of layers of protection. Um, and, you know, your, your cybersecurity program uh, has to look at all different uh, focuses from, you know, preventing them from even getting into the network, whether it's from an external or an internal. I, I think there are just so many different things that healthcare organizations should be doing um, to provide lots and lots of layers of protection. Um, you know, monitoring services and uh, being able to respond to all of the different, um, you know, s s questionable uh, activities, uh, uh, behavioral, you know, education of, of your people and don't click those links and uh, pay attention to what's happening. Um, you know, there's just so many different areas to focus on. Um, I think healthcare organizations that adopt a standard framework of cybersecurity uh, and leverage those frameworks will um, develop those kind of multi-layered uh, methods of protecting their environment. It's a, it's a constant battle. It's a very highly dynamic world. It's changing constantly. You're never done. Um, it takes a lot of focus, a lot of attention, unfortunately, to protect the organizations. Um, and I think it's one of the biggest challenges we have uh, in our industry. Um, but, you know, those that, you know, stick with it and are creative and uh, constantly evolving will uh, probably fare a bit weather better. But we're all susceptible, unfortunately, and uh, we try to do our best to provide lots and lots of layers of protection. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, before we wrap up, I have a, I wanted to get your thoughts on the, the FDA recently put out a mandate or updated guidance on grandfathering IoT devices. And I just wanted to, A, I assume you've seen it, and B, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Because it, it's really going to Im impact every healthcare organization in the country. Well, I, I think the FDA has been trying to um, help in this regard um, with their, their language. I know that they have provided comments on, you know, the, the issue of patch management and tried to make it possible for manufacturers to move more quickly. Um, I, I guess I am... Uh, I think it's going to take clear regulatory language to really solve this problem. So I look to the FDA as that body that needs to help us solve this problem and correctly interpret the language so that these manufacturers do what they're supposed to do. Um, I think sometimes it gets their language gets misinterpreted. Um, and, right. uh, 
people take highly conservative approaches to the language, but you know, we need to be clear and uh, we need to lay that regulatory requirement down so the manufacturers respond. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you so much to our guest, uh, Debbie Gash. Uh, and thank you also for our listeners uh, for joining us today. If you have feedback about today's podcast or questions for David, Debbie, or the Overwatch team, please contact us at podcast at highwirenetworks.com or leave a comment below. And be sure to join us for our next episode, Chat GPT. The good, the bad, and the ugly. This should be a a very interesting conversation, David. Um, So until next time, I'm Susanna Song. I'm Dave Barton. And this is Cybersecurity Simplified. From all of us here at Overwatch by Highwire Networks, thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, rate the episodes you enjoyed, share, and leave us a comment. We'll catch you next time on a Cybersecurity Simplified podcast. Remember, the more you know about cybersecurity, the safer you'll be. To learn more, visit us at highwirednetworks.com slash podcasts.